<laughs> okay, so I was going to introduce uh, Zubair Bhatti, who's a third year graduate student uh, working on the Atlas experiment and uh, the tie to uh, the Center for Cosmology and Particle Physics. Um, he's going to be talking about, I think, kind of the evolution of a story that goes back to uh, 10 years ago, 2011, here that started here in the center. Uh, so, uh, Itai Evin, who some of you may remember, who is a James Arthur Fellow, and I partnered on a project which was basically a statement that the experiments, when they get done doing some analysis and they write a paper, that they should really try to keep track of that analysis pipeline so it can be reused and repurposed in different ways. Um, that was just kind of an idea for a number of years. Uh, I had a former graduate student, Lucas Heinrich, who really took this up as his thesis topic. And uh, it was a kind of a high risk, high reward thesis topic, uh, but that ended up working out well for him. Uh, so he was then a CERN fellow and just became a faculty member in Munich. Um, and uh, and uh, anyway, so that is, has changed a lot and they're kind of at a tipping point in the, you know, the, within the Atlas experiment at least. And uh, now with that, we're sort of thinking about how does this change our approach broadly? And that's, uh, I think, roughly the topic that we bear has for us today. So take it away, Zubair. Thank you. Uh, yeah, hello. Uh, my name is Zubair Mati. Um, and my research interests are uh, at the interface between experiment and theory, uh, specifically in particle physics uh, at the Large Hadron Collider. Um, this, this talk is you know, more of an introduction to my research area and what I'm interested in. Uh, but I believe like some of the bigger ideas uh, can be applied to other domains as well. Um, and about, uh, sure, yeah. so um, it, I kind of want to present my, my talk in about um, four sections. Um, first is just, uh, I want to talk about experiment and theory uh, at the LHC. Um, and then I want to talk about um, uh, some, some ideas about prediction and inference. Uh, and finally, um, before getting into kind of some updates out of Atlas, which is one of the uh, big, uh, you know, which is one of the four larger experiments at the Large Hadron Collider, uh, I want to introduce this idea about reinterpretation, which Kyle was mentioning, uh, you know, has been an idea um, in the works for, for over a decade. Um, Uh, so, if you'll allow me to kind of start with, um, you know, broadly speaking about experiment and theory, uh, then uh, I want to I want to start by discussing like these different realms, um, where experiment uh, we can categorize, we can we can uh, investigate in the space of data. Um, and theory, we can investigate in the space of QFD models, for example, um, that may have or that have some Lagrangian description uh, with parameters uh, composed of masses and coupling constants. <clears throat> um, connecting these two uh, spaces, uh, we can, you know, go from theory, uh, let's say some sort of SUSY model. Uh, or a dark matter uh, predicting model, um, you know, going from theory to this space of data, uh, we'll call that prediction. And going from uh, the space of data uh, to uh, the space of uh, theory, we'll roughly label that path as inference. Um, and I, uh, so before I get into these, these two pathways, uh, I want to discuss about like what the space of data looks like and also what the space of models um, can look like. Uh, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so let's see, uh, starting with some of the data at the Atlas experiment. Um, um, so at Atlas, uh, you know, sorry, at the Large Hadron Collider, um, one of the interaction points for um, uh, these collisions that I'm going to 
describe briefly uh, where about um, where about 25 million times per second there are these bunches of protons uh, which cross uh, at the at atlas at CMS um, and inside of each of these bunches of protons or inside of each of these bunches are about 10 to the 11 protons uh, and as many as that is, we really only see about 30 collisions or so for crossing. Um, and I'll um, say that this corresponds to <clears throat> over the course of like, you know, 14 years from 2009 projected into uh, 2023. Um, that's, that's not right. <laughs> um, you see about 10 to the uh, 15 uh, scattering events or collision events. And what these events can look like, uh, for example, is uh, if we have some proton, uh, if we have these two protons that, um, that interact, uh, not really going into the details of what is happening here with the um, with their quark interaction, um, we might see uh, you know final states with electron pair production. Um, uh, we'll see you know some some other things, but inside the atlas detector, uh, what the detector itself sees uh, or can reconstruct are uh, tracks of these electrons. Um, if there's any free quarks uh, that hadronize, they'll show up as these objects called jets. Um, the detector can, um, you know, uh, see energy deposits of these jets. And can I ask a question? Yes, please. What do you mean by the word hadronize? Hadronize. Uh, so these these free quarks. Um, the amount of energy that they have, uh, they're, they don't, I mean, they don't want to be free. They, they will pull out other quarks and gluons uh, from the vacuum. And so it, that consecutive process uh, shows up as a large collimated uh, deposit of energy in the, in the detector. So it'll like, you have a free quark, but it, but then it'll, actually just sort of turn into like a regular hadron of some sort uh, of, of some sort like as as it pulls out quarks and gluons um it'll create uh uh it'll um, form mesons and baryons uh, okay. and consecutively like lowering the, the energy down so you have to show up as fast okay okay and i the e plus e minus is just some example to draw. It's not like a yeah. It's not a, yeah, and so and so this is a potential um, final product. Uh, so this is kind of a, not a great. It's not really a binding diagram. It's just you know some stuff at the beginning. This is potentially what can be seen at the end. And through an energy conservation argument, um, the proton bunches that that cross uh, through each other that the uh, um, the center of mass energy is, is is known, so we can so the data that we end up seeing can actually be um, reconstructed to uh, also provide the missing energy of potentially neutrinos that leave the detector or dark matter candidates. And the ten to the fifteen is that. Is that really because there are only 10 to the 15 interesting collisions, or is it because of the kind of um, bandwidth of the system that's all you can write to disk? Um, this is integrated luminosity. Uh, there is a yeah, is that I guess that's actually more what I'm asking. Is that the number? Is that the number of collisions that are happening? Yes, or is yes. that the number of collisions that are writing to disk? You're not writing all of that to no, disk. No, no, no. No, this and this is also I'm saying that this is the total um from 2019 to, to yeah, yeah, projected right. to And since each one is a pretty big payload, you can't write those all. Right, right. So this is uh this is all the um interactions that are uh, that you know that that take place uh Later, we'll talk about how this how this scales. Good. So um, the luminosity is really a property of the 
physical device, yes. not the full data yes. recording system. Yes. Uh, I mean, the physical device. Accelerator. Uh, yeah, you know, including the beam. <laughs> including the beam. Yeah, that's an idea. Um, but uh, uh, but one thing that's interesting here, and I think maybe you're about to talk about, is that there's so many different levels of abstraction to talk about the data, because like the detector, of course, is got some readouts of calorimeters or whatever. But even there, you're already talking about tracks of particles, which is like a non-trivial inference from my perspective. Yeah, yeah. is a non-trivial inference. And when you started talking about the thing, you're actually talking about e plus e, you know, e minus and jet, you know, and yeah. things and missing energy and stuff. Anyway, yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, it's pretty yeah, interesting. That's a that's a really good point. So like, I am I am making some some big jumps here. Um, there's an entire um, modeling process that happens here as well, uh, and, and uh, I'm I'm not going to go go into to that. I'm kind of just taking for granted that we get these readouts. Um, we can reconstruct the the collision events, um, and there are, there'll be associated systematic uncertainties. Uh, 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 and so then we can, you know, make a histogram of the number of events we see. And uh, let's say we're interested um, in the invariant mass of these two leading electrons. Uh, then we can, you know, we can count them um, and plot, plot something like that. So this is, this is, you know, maybe like how this is like one projection um, of a very specific set of events in this data uh, that we're, that we're looking at here. Um, we could count uh, missing energy um, as well and, and make a distribution like that, or make a history of that. Don't mind me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm just going to be book in case you go over. I'm, I'm not even the camera. <laughs> okay. Uh, and then, and then I might like stage manager. It's <laughs> <laughs> uh, like Trump at the debates. You're just like hanging around. My yeah. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't pull me in for a strong pinch. Um, so the so um, I'm going to also refer to this space of data as the kinematic phase space. That's uh, uh, of you know, of the experiment as well. Uh, but I'll just put that here. Uh, good. So that's so that's the data. Um, that's what it you know can kind of look like. Um, then the next the next the next aspect uh, is what the space of the theory can look like. And let's say we're interested uh, in measuring standard model events. Um, Sorry, uh, let's say we're, we're interested in some uh, in some new model, um, and it has you know parameters theta again masses and coupling constants, uh, and it can be written as this as the you know as the terms from the standard model Lagrangian and the and whatever beyond standard model um, Lagrangian uh, terms as well. So you know this can be a Susie, uh, this can be like a Susie terms. Um, and uh, as we have seen from like, you know, our QFT classes, you can calculate the uh, cross section uh, for a interaction or for the, you know, for, for a process um, that produces electrons and let's say neutrinos to kind of demonstrate that this is what potentially the missing energy might be. Uh, we can take the matrix element squared from that and to get something like the total number of expected events, we can take this 10 to the 15 collisions um, and multiply it by the, uh, by the standard model process that we're interested in. <clears throat> um, now the beyond standard model part um, is parameterized by theta. So this is a choice that we have. Um, and let's say that process that we're interested in is um, the pair production of two electrons and uh, some dark matter uh, candidate chi. And we take the um, matrix element squared and we can um, get this total number of, uh, of beyond standard model events. Um, and uh, 
yeah, having multiplied by the by the by the cross section, get the total number of standard of beyond standard model points. I have a question, which yes. you're gonna have to forgive me for. Yeah. But whenever I go, lots of times when I go to high energy physics talk, I see things like this diagram yeah. plus other diagram or diagram in this case squared. Okay. Are there like rules about <laughs> when? Because when I learned calculus, I couldn't do things like that. <laughs> I had to like have variables in there and things like that, and a specific math. Yeah, yeah, sure. Like, oh, is, is, is this? But is this like a very specific notation, or is this? Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, also one thing to maybe to make clear is that um, this isn't a sum over like all possible processes that have this final state. I'm actually using this this uh, this black circle as in I don't know what exactly the process is, but there's just one process. Uh, so, for example, uh, uh, you know, this well, I don't want to go there, but it could be like Z's. Uh, but I think that I mean he's he's yeah. doing this schematically. I mean, like yeah. more carefully, there would be full Feynman diagrams, and but you could learn the Feynman rules, that. which you decode that drawing into an actual you know equation. Uh, and, and that you can realize on a computer and have dot products between things and it, it spits out a complex number, which is an amplitude. And when you square it, you get something like a, you know, like a Yeah, I get I get that, but is this is that like fully specified? Or is this a shorthand for some other notation also involving diagrams that's that that is fully specified? I, mean, I think you're just using it schematically to mean okay. like that you turn the standard model crank uh, and, and you know there are a bunch of diagrams and you're going to square them and there's tools to to do that. Um, yeah, like this, like the software you put in the process that you're interested in, um, it'll use some assumption about quantum distribution functions. You know, it'll uh, it'll also model that. Well, we'll talk about modeling this in a second, but um, but yeah, even before introducing the detector effect and stuff, you can you can calculate this from um in certain regimes right uh from first principles yeah that that i believe i'm just, i was sort of asking about this 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 notation like whether this oh, yeah. was yeah yeah this uh, was like <laughs> something that was yeah. that had like very specific meanings but anyway well, yeah. go on should serve as like but actually <laughs> I, just to further derail you uh <laughs> are the beyond the standard model things that people talk about really specific enough that that if you set the parameters, you really can compute the cross sections. Uh, yes, yes. So uh, they are that specific. Yeah, actually, I can. Because um, in this room, people tend to like, you know, <laughs> not be very specific about. Well, that's what the beta is, right? There's parameters. Right. So in principle, if you specified every parameter in there, you'd be able to compute it. Uh, yes. I mean, just to kind of maybe I should have uh, you know made this a bit clearer, but let's say the beyond standard model stuff. Uh, is you know some uh, like this, uh, and then the I want to just show where the where the where the free parameters are. I guess yeah, that's kind of more specifically. But if we have some model that that, for, that um, I think it's the two double model, but I'm not a, um, a you know expert at that by any means. I'm very familiar with it. But if it proposes something like a massive, like a more massive Higgs uh, and some pseudo scalar boson like A, then just kinematically you can see that at the you know with with these fixed with these fixed, yeah. um, you can see that the, that the only free parameters are these two masses. Uh, so you can. You can put these into your uh, into your simulator, uh, and yeah, and, and then you can just compute the Feynman compute. diagrams exactly. Yeah. yeah, it's really it's really concrete at that page. Yeah, yeah. and in some sense, it's kind of a problem. It'd be nice if we had like a less concrete way of. <laughs> yeah, no, I was going to say that. I mean, yeah. It's triggering all my data analysis uh, concerns. Cons <laughs> that another question. So, in terms of. What's the kind of general level for standard model processes and the knowledge of those? How well do we know those? Because when we look at beyond the standard, that's another kind of unknowns. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, how how well? What the, what's the level that we know and what we need to reach to actually infer any kind of dark matter? Beyond standard. Um, 
as far as like precision, I think this is like a question about precision physics, maybe. Um, but like I am, I am assuming that that we know the parameters of the standard model well enough that that this is our concern now. And also all the processes, right? I mean, not just the oh, sure, all sure. the processes that yeah. go, all the squaring, uh, right? Kind right. Of squaring. Uh, yeah, and I mean, even here I'm doing a bit of a disservice, sorry, uh, because you know it's not it's not just um, these two, like, it's not just this process that that contributes to this final state, right? It can be anything in between. Mm -hmm. uh, but, I, but I'm just kind of showing that I don't know what this is, but frankly, we have software that can predict or that can calculate what these crop shots should be given all the standard model terms. I think your question is a good question. I think also we should come back to it towards later because it'll make more sense exactly later. I think yeah. it's a good question. So. We have read a little bit in astronomy. We're looking for new things like the known unknowns, the unknown right. unknowns. Yeah, how, how, and in astronomy, of course, it's crazy because we have a lot of you know, yeah. you know, astrophysics that we don't know yet that could happen. These, but I'm just curious the kind of basic. Yeah, I mean these these hypotheses are like simple like hypotheses like where we where we know what the parameters. Are. So for something like like this model, we'll have like I mean, I think there's another coupling. Uh, anyways, there's like these two coupling constants and two masses. Uh, but, we, but we'll fix, we could fix two of them, uh, then fix the third one and scan over one and just you know, produce a big table of, of, uh, of cross sections. So, okay. Um, okay, so now the prediction realm, uh, going from uh, theory to um, to data, what, what we might expect to see um, oh, I'm in space. <laughs> um, is for a given choice theta, um, we, we believe that our model has some, uh, has some prediction about the way that the kinematic phase space should look. Uh, and if we're interested in investigating that, uh, we'll make a, um, sorry, uh, what, what we actually end up um, being able to see in our simulation is uh, the effect, sorry, what, what we actually end up being able to describe as far as the distribution um, of, let's say the invariant mass of these two electrons um, uh, are also dependent on the efficiency uh, of, this region as a function of theta. Uh, I don't know if I described that. I think you need to describe the circle and the square. You know, like, yeah. yeah. So, so I mean, here this is, you know, this is what your model says about the phase space or what it can say about the kinematic phase space here. But what's practically, um, but we, but we practically have access to in an analysis. Is dependent on 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 the structure of the detector, um, all of the reconstruction effects as well, um, and so we can. So because this is only dependent on theta in this in this framework, um, we can take uh, that theta and apply it to the total number of expected events, and what we can actually measure. Um, or what we can predict for the distribution of these electrons um, for their invariant mass, you know, might might be something like this, where the beyond standard model physics shows up as a bump um, as a result of uh, this is not a good diagram for that, but <laughs> but as a result of some new particle being produced on shell. So is the idea over here that like the circle you drew is like all of the parts of kinematic phase space that are kind of affected by that or yes. sensitive to that parameter. Yes. And then the square is like the parts after your cuts and triggers and reconstructions yeah. that you can actually count. Yeah, yeah. And um, I mean, I don't, I, I don't think I'll get into the specifics of how an, an analysis uh, might, might look, but cuts and um, things of that nature is where we have you know, these 10 to the 15 events, and we, uh, well, we have much less than we actually have written on disk, but 
not every event, for example, has these final right. states, right? Yeah. So, uh, so the effect of, of what we actually have access to. Um, yeah, I think that the language you were using for me earlier, which you, you didn't say, I think it was really nice when you said it to me earlier, but the, 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 the ellipse is kind of like the theory, the BSM part is going to populate phase space, right? So there's yep. a distribution of phase space. So the, cir the, the circle there, inner circle is supposed to be like broadly, this is the region of phase space populated by the, the new physics model. And then the square was like, whatever selection you have on the data, like you're going to ask specifically for events that have electrons in this AT or something like that. Yeah. Okay. Um, good. And uh, well, this is, um, yeah, so this, you know, this, this can be our signal. Uh, and this will be, uh, you know, standard model background. Uh, and I'm only really showing like one background, but many standard model events um, can contribute to the background here if we're only looking for one signal. Uh, but what happens if we change data? Like what happens to this distribution? Open question. Like what can happen to this to this distribution? The map moves depending on the parameters, then the mass you will change of the operator, and it, depending on the phase space you will squeeze or spread. Yeah, basically yeah. the pump moves. Yeah, okay, great, great. So um yeah, so we can see that really the free parameter here is is all in the beyond standard model physics. Um, so that's gonna only affect you know this model, this uh, the signal distribution. Um, uh, so now we can talk about inference. Uh, so inference is, you know, visually you can see what's going to happen next is we have some simulated data, we have some observed stuff, uh, so we want to see how well does our model um, explain the data that we're interested in. Um, so our distribution for our background events, you know, can be smoothly following a thing like this. Um, and our uh, signal will show up as a resonance bump. Um, and we overlay this distribution on the data that we have access to, uh, and we ask ourselves, you know, how well um, or how consistent is is our model with data? Um, and I, I think you can probably see from here, for example, uh, this specific outcome uh, isn't in, isn't consistent with with the data. But the standard model um, explains the data better than the standard model. Right, and uh, another possibility, uh, yeah, and so, and so we'll say that if the signal um, at, at a certain value of theta uh, does not, is, 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 in, is inconsistent with the data, then we'll exclude that choice theta from, uh, from, uh, Choices of what the model can uh, can have. Um, alternatively, this is possible that the signal uh, is not separated well enough from standard model predictions, uh, and then that's just inconclusive, uh, and we'll need to you know investigate further. Cool. Uh, so you can see that we can we can scan you know theta, and we could potentially move move this bump around and see uh, what different predictions, um, you know, how they, how they affect the signal distribution uh, and potentially what, what might end up happening is in this model space, we might end up excluding, you know, like a pretty large chunk of the parameter space that data lives in. Um, just do, you know, uh, constant, uh, or just to just by scanning over this data. <clears throat> uh, and now, um, how how do we do this? Well, this is like you know maybe the first idea uh, about how do we reinterpret um, 
a analysis that we've done is, you know, at the most basic level, we can scan over uh, data values. Um, but what's, what's more interesting um, and potentially, you know, more impact having is if the analysis that we've designed is sensitive to a completely alternative model, um, then we can ask ourselves, you know, how efficient uh, is uh, how efficient is our, I guess, selection and criteria uh, to to an alternate model, right? And I purposefully am not like rewriting suits in the dark matter again because I kind of want to leave it general. But um, yeah, so if our uh, so this this idea um, about reinterpretation is is how can we reuse an analysis, um, just substituting in the signal that I'm kind of interested in uh, writing some. And by analysis, like in in your uh, in your example above, analysis is those four data points with error bars. Uh, sure. So uh, so the, let's say the prediction um, and uh, sorry, not prediction. Uh, I should say the data um, and uh, the model. Uh, comparing those to statistical inference, which is this step right here, visually displayed, um, leads to some physical result, uh, which measures the, uh, the compatibility of our model with data. That whole process is, is, is analysis. Right? Okay, but I think, well, I mean, yeah. he's asking, is it the four that, that, data points, right? Uh, here, yeah. Sorry, yeah, what was your question? Did I, well, I guess my part, I guess my question is which part because parts of that get reused and parts don't. Yeah, yeah, right. I'm exactly. Uh, okay. So sorry. Yeah, great, great, great question. Uh, and that that brings me into um, what is reused, right? So I was saying that if this analysis is sensitive to another model, um, well, if that other model fits in the same, uh, you know, in the same form, then the analysis can really only uh, then that we can freeze the background estimates, for example, and we can we can focus just on, on, the, on the signal that uh, that our alternative model is um, interesting. And I guess one thing that's going on here, from the point of view like of astronomy, so in astronomy, things are kind of different because because you, it's easier in astronomy to go back to the raw data, but you're working with an extremely complicated device where you don't want to, you said at the beginning that you, you want to assume that the raw data have been processed into events and event histograms like accurately. Yeah. And so like a context thing that's kind of interesting in this room is that is that your reinterpretation is like reinterpretation of kind of what we might call like high level data products, things that are at yeah, the yeah. end of a big data analysis chain. And I would use a little quick to, I would use a quick to say yes to that. <laughs> uh, I mean, in, in, I guess, um, yeah, I was about to. Uh, <laughs> so we're not analyzing history. The, yes. the, and I think you haven't yes. used the word pipeline. I think what to, the answer to Michael's question. Okay. Right. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'll just screw you in the right. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So this. This is like the analysis pipeline, um, or this flow um, of, of uh, you know having all of your data um, and, uh, and 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 the and the predictions um, and interpreting those two aspects and coming to some sort of um, yeah measure of consistency. All that software is is the analysis pipeline that that does that, but. Um, it can go further back. It just becomes it just becomes you know more more complex. Um, I'm not I'm not uh, saying that your analysis couldn't start uh, here, right? Um, it can. You can also this. There, there's also a model here that is that is making uh, yeah that we're that we're measuring. But I mean to calculate this efficiency, what all do you need to know to calculate the, the sufficiency for a new model? Uh, yeah, I guess um, in order to yeah, 
what all do you need? I mean, like, what, what is it? What is the efficiency dependent on? Or uh, would you not quite? Can you phrase that question? Um, I don't know. I mean, I you, you gave me a preview of what you're going to say, so I just like a. But I think you're going to talk about like what all is preserved. I think. It, the, the, the thing you're drawing there is looks very high level, but there's a lot of low level stuff that's hard that has to be preserved. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah. think that's kind of what both of them are after. Yeah, okay. Yeah, um, yeah sorry. Uh, yeah. That is that is the next step. Um, yeah, maybe so, we should just let you continue. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so, okay, so what all needs to be preserved in order to make reinterpretation possible? Good, that's yeah. The question. Okay. Yeah, that's um, good, good. Uh, so, there's kind of like two, two big aspects, uh, which is you know this this analysis pipeline, which is a lot of the software aspect, uh, but but also the statistical model that we use to describe um, uh, this plot, uh, right? So let me uh, let me just start with analysis preservation. So I guess I'm kind of just going to talk about the prerequisites for making reinterpretation a practical thing you can do. Um, so, uh, yeah, so for analysis preservation, um, these are all the things you need to capture in order to be able to just re rerun uh, this aspect of the inference. Um, so it's it's all of the data, uh, both the simulated and the observed data. Uh, it's it's all of your your code that does the statistical inference itself. Um, it's like the it's like the parameters that you use to generate this signal. You know, saving all of that information. Um, it's the library versions on your computer that you ran. You know, Python with the operating system version. It's it's a lot of like software -y stuff, um, but like you know, as physicists, I don't think we're that interested in like trying to make that better. Uh, but we also don't have to worry too much about it because a lot of like cloud computing companies, big tech companies, have, have really identified these problems for their own use, uh, and they've 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 made it a lot easier for us to to practically do reinterpretation. Um, so we piggyback off of a lot of their technology development, uh, but there's obviously extra things that we need to go into into analysis preservation that is specific to this. Um, so can I just add one thing? So then I think because you're putting a lot of emphasis on the high level statistical stuff, but like to go back to David's point at the very beginning, you have very raw sensor level data, and then you drew that line for the electron track, right? And that line is like just is defined by some algorithm that looks at the sensor level data yeah. and decides if there's a, an electron there, for instance, right? Yeah. So that algorithm, do, do we need to preserve that algorithm for this reinterpretation? Um, yes. And the reason why you have to preserve that is there is a, um, there's like this, this distribution that I drew here, I kind of ignored that you can calculate these aspects, the cross section of the first principles, but then there's an entire software chain uh, that um, that simulates how these processes uh, play out in the in the detector, uh, and that is also simulated. Uh, so, so, uh, so I see because there could be non-trivial kinematic predictions in the theory, which would which would yeah project onto the way you do this identification and measurement with the device. Because your new theory might have. To like E plus E minus, but also some muons and some other things, yeah, and right. other jets, and uh, yeah, 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 right. And then you you have to you have to push it through the whole detector simulation, all of the reconstruction software, the the trigger simulation, yeah. the yeah. entire pipeline. You have to preserve the entire data analysis pipeline that's used on the real data. So it's not it's not you're not just munging like high level histogram data products. Mm -hmm. You have to like it's the full blown software stack, which is a challenge. Uh, so, yeah. So then, the other aspect is, you know, there's there's all the software that's 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 used to um, to run the statistical inference, uh, but we also need, in order to do this reinterpretation, where we only substitute in a signal, uh, we also need to be able to preserve um, the full statistical model, and that's where I'm going to 
Okay, so uh, uh, let's see. yeah, and so there's like a full statistical model. Um, um, that describes, you know, in this in this framework uh, that that describes the distribution of uh, background events. Uh, since we said that the background events are standard model, which doesn't depend on data, uh, we can, you know, we can, uh, you know, we don't have to worry about the dependence there. Uh, there's the number of signal events, uh, which is dependent on data. Uh, and then there's also the distribution of the signal events uh, on, on normalized, just by the, by the counts uh, of, of these events. And yeah, so this, so this B and S are just the integrals um, of, uh, of these two, of the background signal distribution. And so if we can preserve, sorry, uh, if we can preserve this full statistical model, then we really can, um, we can, we can let ourselves only have to calculate the signal changes when we reinterpret an analysis. Um, all of the rest is, is broken. I think going back also to David's point earlier, he was like, you know, part of this was like, well, can you go back to the raw data? You can go back to the raw data and you could design an analysis that's targeted for this new theory. It's just like two years of effort of a team of people. You know, it's not, so part of the point of this is just like, can we squeeze some more out of what we already already did? Um, it's not gonna be optimal, but it's a lot more efficient from a time perspective. Those, those same questions, by the way, come up in projects that we do in astronomy, where we have to decide at what level do people want to interact with the data when they ask new questions that we haven't thought about. And we often make mistakes. Like uh, I mean, mentioned, that the stimulate detector telescope. Yeah, like what? Yeah, what do we need anyway? It's a very right, well. You, a lot of it. A lot of times, it's subtracting the background. Exactly. Do you want to subtract the background, or do you not want to subtract the background? <laughs> yeah, I suppose it depends on how well you, you believe you have the background model. Right. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and, and again, I'm assuming that we have it wrong. Right, which also relates to Mariam's. So, so I guess uh, I just want to start talking like a little bit about the progress at, at Atlas, um, which is a specific experiment that I'm, uh, that I'm working with, uh, with Kyle. And um, yeah, so there's been a big push uh, to, um, you know, make sure that all of the uh, data, um, which I kind of am using maybe too heavily or too too loaded, uh, but there's been a big push at, at, at the Large Hadron Collider to you know, publish data, keep, keep all of that open. Um, so you know, people that aren't even physicists, for example, can just focus on the statistical inference aspect um, and do some you know, machine learning or whatever smart ideas that they have and not have to worry about the physics. Um, so that's really open. Um, uh, high energy physics to a lot of innovation. Um, and there's also been a requirement for, uh, uh, for Suzy searches uh, and dark matter searches uh, to publish like full likelihoods. Um, and so here's yeah, so some of these. Uh, This is just like some of the stuff that's been happening that has kind of made reinterpretation a more timely effort to, to work on. Um, and recently there's also been uh, a requirement for, um, for searches to publish their full statistical models, uh, which is which we talked about is necessary in order to um, do reinterpretation efficiently. Um, another big thing is like right now, Large Hadron Collider is shut down, um, so undergoing upgrades, but in March when it starts up again, um, the, the center of mass energy, like the, the operating energy is gonna, is that right? Is that right? So uh, it's gonna change um, from 
from 13 TeV to 14 TeV, uh, which is going to affect the kinematic phase space. Uh, it's going to broaden the kinematic phase space that we have access to. Uh, so finding a way to keep all of this. Um, so finding a way to improve the uh, the uh, systematic way that we explore the data um, with our models is going is, is is more relevant. Than Uh, so currently, the way that these analyses are handled um, at Atlas, for example, is uh, you'll have uh, some analysis, and now that we have them preserved, this is really good, uh, so we can rerun um, a analysis, but the analyses themselves may not be super coordinated, even though they are exploring um, you know, as much as the kinematic phase space as possible uh, for your specific models that they're interested in, there might actually be overlaps. Um, and what this means is that even, even though we have all these analyses that are preserved, reinterpreting them, um, we may not actually have, uh, you know, as much efficiency as possible because there's this overlap in these in these regions, uh, so we can only really pick one. Uh, so, one of the one of the ideas um, that we're that are being uh, you know pursued right now, and this is kind of the the, the stuff that I'm interested in, <clears throat> is uh, treating the kinematic phase space, you know, partitioning it up in like a very you know straightforward way, I guess in hindsight, uh, and, you know, seeing, well, what can we, um, what can we design our analysis for, and how can we, you know, if efficiently explore all of this kinematic phase space, uh, and what can we what does this do mean? with respect to automation? Um, and so the automation aspect is going to come in, you know, here, uh, we might want to generate um, all of these background, sorry, generate all these signal distributions. Um, and so this is a automation process that I'll be, uh, that I'm starting to, to work on. And yeah, so um, yeah, so in short, you know, I just wanted to present some ideas about how models are tested. Uh, but the bottom line is uh, experimentalists, you know, are uh, working very hard to reduce statistical and systematic uncertainties uh, and increasing the breadth and depth of the data that we have access to. Um, and theorists and phenomenologists as well are working very hard to come up, um, you know, with, with ways to explain the fundamentals. Um, but by taking a analysis focused uh, approach to some of these physics, Questions uh, we can make sure that you know none of that, none of their efforts go uh, go to waste. And uh, yeah, I mean, I uh, if there's any hanging questions, um, I would uh, like to address them. <laughs> are there any questions? They're sort of dominated by the front of the room, but. Are there? Yes. yes. I have a question. So the, the last thing you mentioned about automation. So I suppose what you want to do is to automate the computation of the Feynman diagrams from the Bianconer model. Uh, that is that is part of the practical problems at the, you know at at Atlas or sorry um, actually at the Large Hadron Collider. There's like a working group uh -huh. which which is responsible. The Large Hadron Collider is massive, right? There's a, there's a massive collaboration. There's different working groups who are interested in SUSY and you know many black holes left of quartz. Um, but even even there, there's still a partition about people that are interested in measurements, um, right? And the working group that that calculates these distributions, uh, they're they're uh, ripe for some automation. <laughs> 
I thought that, but you, you were drawing this picture about this more systematic approach to partitioning phase space, and then you went and mentioned the, uh, the models, the theory, that's the theory side. Yeah, yeah. So uh, which thing are you wanting to automate? Uh, gonna, yeah, so, I mean, as part of like my, I mean, like specifically for me, like my um, authorship uh, task is gonna be involved in this, but the, but the more interesting stuff that I'm, you know, like the more long-term stuff that I'm interested in, is uh, I mean this is going to be a very very crude drawing, but um, uh, is if we have these different models, uh, let's say like lepto quarks or something like that, um, is is automating the parameter uh, uh, I lost the word uh, like automating searching over the parameter space in these in these models. But I, mean, I think you, you said it, but I don't know that you emphasized it much, but the, the, the transition to just making the, the part the more systematic organized marching over base space, that's kind of the, that's a big transition. Yes. I mean, uh, first right. you have to do that before you do yeah. the marching over theories, right? But yes, yes, yes. Uh, so, um, yes, this is, this is a non-trivial. <laughs> and is, is that because the standard and the typical analyses that have happened have been kind of like bespoke regions of of kinematics of the kinematic phase space that have been considered like in I, what sense yeah. are people drawing boxes here they've made choices about what kinds of events they're thinking about uh, that's that's probably more of a historical like uh, i mean my understanding is if you're interested in a model you're going to look for what regions in phase space your specific model again like this specific parameter range uh has to say about the distribution of phase space. i see so, so not all parts different. of phase space have kind of been treated equally here. yeah yeah absolutely um uh, there's yeah uh, but i think it's part of how it's marked. in a morphological approach to the problem and that also, the question that also gets a little bit i think to mariam's question about how well you understand it is that there's some parts of the phase space where the the predictions are very precise, mm. and you can just you can automate things very effectively. And then there are other regions of, of the space space where our our first principles predictions are not really up to snuff, mm. and you and you need more like data driven approaches to try to understand backgrounds and things. And that's just very hard to automate. So trying to figure out the kind of convex hole of which part of the phase space you can kind of automate and not is, is going to be part of the part of the challenge. Yeah. Um, yeah, so the, I guess this is the statistical power like here is, 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 is going to be limited just because both, you know, the standard model uh, predictions are, are low and you're going to be dominated by uh, uncertainties. Uh, and this uncertainty is probably can be uh, uh, proved if you can compute more loops. Is that right? People have a, or is it more about like detector issues or whatever? Is it more about like computation or is it about yeah. detector? The um, in the simulated aspect, uh, I'm not. I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, mean, I imagine they both do come into play. So they're both probably both limiting factors. Uh, and then, for example, the loop diagram stuff. Um, you know, it depends on the regime of, of QCD that you're interested in. So and how well you trust your models. I think that's a bit of both, but the hardest ones are, I mean, a lot of the Monte Carlo is at least next to leading order now and you know, things get more precise, but but the, the big thing that's really hairy is when you have like, uh, you know, jets at some point, you, you know, they're very complicated and then and they, they have some probability that they will fragment in some weird way and fake an electron. And that is some weird mixture between the, the theory part that's very hard to describe and then the detector response. And uh, and so it's, it's a, those things are very hard, you know. So people have a bunch of heuristic ways to try to estimate backgrounds and things, but it's more of a cookbook than a, a kind of a systematic approach. Thank you. More questions? Can you pull down that board just for one minute? And that equate this equation seems like the key a key thing, right? Can you explain this equation just just a little more? Sure. Yeah. Um, well, it's it's a key thing in 
if it's a key thing and if you want to only need to calculate like if let's say you want to reinterpret an analysis but only want to focus on the signal aspect and rerunning that part of the, of the pipeline because really the pipeline like the observed data goes through it the simulated background and the simulated signal all of that goes through it if you if you um for freezing the backgrounds uh if your model doesn't have a um yeah so if you really only want to pass the, the signal through that pipeline then then this becomes important uh, let's say you don't have access to I see. the data. That's because so, that's yeah. because theta doesn't appear at PD. Yeah, yeah. I mean, B and S are just the counts of okay. background and signal events. But what we talked about here, um, uh, this, you know, if you don't have access to the version of software or the hardware that was used, you know, and to to come up with with your um, with this data. And you only have access to, let's say, the, the estimates, um, then then that becomes important uh, that you really only want to substitute in the signal, and you don't want to. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think really that's something that sort of what you're saying, like possibly like the, you know, that that equation where you can make some statistical model is sort of like describing the distribution of the data, but inside of that box, right? And all of the information that describes the box requires the entire like software stack of the experiment, right? So there's kind of a you can make this statistical model public and it's nice and easy. And if your the theory you care about is inside that family, then you can it has everything you need. But if you want to ask about some other theory, just like some data that's disconnected, you know, then you have to go all the way back to the entire pipeline and run it through the box and everything. And that um, and, and that's previously we didn't have that, but now um, in some sense, that's one of the things that's that's, sort of that's happening now is that people are actually uh, preserving them. So. Yeah, it's a, it's a requirement. yeah, those requirements are very interested, interesting. And some parts of cosmology have moved to a kind of likelihood and expectation predict uh, preservation. In fact, the Lambda archive at NASA is a started as an archive to preserve likelihood functions for cosmology missions. Okay. Okay. Um, I think, I mean, the more I've worked on data analysis, the more I think this is the way we need to preserve, because uh, we often talk about what data do we need to preserve, but it's actually not enough to preserve the data. You do have to preserve these probabilistic models or people can't reproduce results. So this is the future. Yeah, You're yeah. definitely working on the future of data analysis here. Uh, and uh, yeah, that, that reminds me, I'm also uh, you know, going to be forming my, uh, my Committee. <laughs> 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 I thought this was a meeting. <laughs> 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 <laughs>